Welcome to Word for Wednesday. My grateful thanks goes to the team alongside me today. That's Catherine and Alison for their prayers, Georgie for her reading, Darian for his music, and Joanne for her technical work in putting this together. Our call to worship is from Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen. Let's come before God in prayer. Almighty God, creator and ruler of all, we come to acknowledge your greatness and your love for humankind. We thank you for your mercy shown to us. Lord, we come to focus our minds upon you and listen to what have you have to say to us today. We're not turning from the world and its needs, but so that we might be able to return to our daily lives with a greater vision of your purpose for us and a deeper sense of your presence around us. Father God, we awaken us afresh to the wonder and mystery of you. We want to worship you, not just with our lips, but with our hearts and our souls too. Lord, whatever situation we find ourselves in today, may, you, may we be equipped to meet it in your name. Great and wonderful God, you deserve our heartfelt and constant praise, for you are all, go all good. Father, we come humbly before you to ask for your forgiveness for our sins. Forgive us when we have let you down, when we have gone our own way. Forgive us for doubting you when things are hard and not trusting that you will see us through. Help us to reach out to those in need wherever they are. Help us to respond to our neighbours, those that you have placed around us. Thank you that the Lord Jesus came so that you are able to forgive your wayward children. Lord, as we approach Pentecost, the time when you sent the Holy Spirit to touch the lives of the apostles, we remember how you took ordinary people, uneducated people, and used them in most extraordinary ways. We rejoice that you are able to use ordinary people like us here and now 
Help us to be ready to see beyond our own limited horizons and to overcome our fears and doubts. Send again your Holy Spirit among us. We simply praise and worship you, our Lord God. Hear this and all our prayers through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Now let's join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Amen. Our Holy Word this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, reading from verse 1 to 15, and I'm reading from the message this morning. Now, friends, I want to report on the surprising and generous ways in which God is working in the churches in Macedonia province. Fierce troubles come down on the people of those churches, pushing them to the very limit. The trial exposed their true colours. They were incredibly happy, though desperately poor. The pressure triggered something totally unexpected, an outpouring of pure and generous gifts. I was there and saw it for myself. They gave offerings of whatever they could, far more than they could afford, pleading for the privilege of helping out in the leaf of poor Christians. This was totally spontaneous, entirely their own idea, and caught us completely off guard. What explains it was that they had first given themselves unreservedly to God and to us. The other giving simply flowed out of the purposes of God working in their lives. That's what prompted us to ask Titus, to bring the relief offering to your attentions, so that what was so well begun could be finished up. You do so well in so many things. You trust God, you're articulate, you're sight insightful, you're passionate, you love us. Now do your best in this too. I'm not trying to order you around against your will, but by bringing in the Macedonians' enthusiasm as a stimulus to your love. I am hoping to bring the best out of you. You are familiar with the generosity of our master, Jesus Christ. Rich as he was, he gave it all away for us. In one stroke, he became poor and we became rich. So here's what I think. The best thing you can do right now is to finish what you started last year and not let those good intentions grow stale. Your heart's been in the right place all along. You've got what it takes to finish up, so go on, go, so go to it. Once the commitment is clear, you do what you can, not what you can't. The heart regulates the hands. This isn't so others can take it easy while you sweat it out, no. You're shoulder to shoulder with them all the way. Your surplus matching their deficit. Their surplus matching your deficit. In the end, you come out even as it was written. Nothing left over to the one who has the most. Nothing lacking to the one with the least. Amen to God's reading to us from his holy word today. Paul is singing the praises of the church in Macedonia. They had heard of the deepening crisis in Jerusalem and had initiated a fundraising effort and people were being encouraged to give as much as they were able. Following his visit to Macedonia, a more general fundraising effort was initiated throughout the nearby regions, with churches particularly being encouraged to give as much as they are able. This dire situation is prevalent in many well-populated countries and people are starving and living in poverty, depending so much on the charity of others. Nothing changes though, does it? 
2,021 years on, there is still a continuing call for help to feed the starving or displaced in the world. And often the situation has got almost out of control before aid finally manages to relieve the situation. Isn't the Bible so relevant to this situation even today? Charitable giving was integral to the lives of the Jewish people, and this carried on in the lives of the early Christians. The annual Feast of Purim is a Jewish holiday that commemorates the deliverance of the Jewish people in the ancient Persian Empire from destruction in the wake of a plot by Haman. A story recorded in the Book of Esther. Part of the celebration is a command to give to the poor. However poor a person is, they are required to find someone in need and give a gift of food. So, compassion for the poor and those in need is at the very heart of the Christian message. We find examples of sacrificial giving in Acts 2 verses 44 and 45, which tells us that believers were selling their possessions and goods in order to give to anyone in need. Interestingly, it also tells us that as they gave up their possessions, God blessed them with added numbers who were being saved. Maybe a few churches today could try that one. These, of course, are not the best of times that we face as a nation. The news is full of austerity measures, euro crisis, national debt, and because of COVID-19, there are calls to divert funds from foreign aid to those who need help in this country. It's a difficult one, isn't it? We probably all know people who have been affected by the economic downslide, either losing jobs, having hours cut, or losing some of their benefits. The church at Corinth was weak. Surrounded by idolatry and immorality, they struggled with their Christian faith and lifestyle. Through personal visits and letters, Paul tried to instruct them in the faith, resolve their conflicts, and solve some of their problems. 1 Corinthians was sent to deal with specific moral issues in the church and to answer questions about sex, marriage, and tender consciences. That letter confronted the issues directly and was well received by most. But there were false teachers who denied Paul's authority and slandered him. Paul then wrote 2 Corinthians to defend his position and so denounced those who were twisting the truth. This must have been a very difficult letter for Paul to write because he had to list his credentials as an apostle. And Paul was reluctant to do this as a he. He was a humble servant as far as he was concerned, but he knew it was necessary. Paul knew that most of the Bush had taken his previous words to heart and were beginning to mature. He affirmed their commitment to Christ. Ministry among the Corinthians to demonstrate the validity of his message urged them not to turn. He next turns to the issue of collecting money for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. He tells them how others have given and urges them to show the angel will be as well. He defends his authority as a genuine apostle while pointing out the deceptive influence of the false apostles. Paul had collected money for the impoverished believers in Jerusalem, the churches in Macedonia, Philippi, Thessalonica and Berea had given money, even though they were poor, and they had given more than Paul expected. That was sacrificial giving. They were poor themselves, but they wanted to help. And you know, the point of giving is not so much the amount we give, but why and how we give. God doesn't want gifts given. Instead, he wants us to give as these churches did, out of dedication to Christ, love, for fellow believers, the joy of helping those in need, as well as the fact that it was simply the good and right thing to do. We at the South and Quarter link up at present through Christian Aid and Tear Fund to do God's work in other countries. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and have a look at Paul's approach to fundraising. He pulls no punches in his letter to the fellowship. He goes straight for the jugular by comparing the giving of other churches and even the self-giving sacrifice of Jesus with the attitude of the Corinthian churches who seemed to have been full of good intentions, according to verse 10, but who had failed to take those intentions through to completeness. That's a very human failing in many of us, which is always intending to do something, but just not getting around to it. And it sounds a wee bit like myself. Look at Jesus, says Paul. 
If you want to know what it means to really give, it's not about words, it's about actions, and it's about the willingness by which you act. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor. So that you, through his poverty, might become rich. So what does Paul mean? His sacrifice didn't begin on the cross. It didn't begin with his birth. It began with the willingness to set heavenly glory and come down to earth as a vulnerable childhood. Let's not forget, as well as being born in the humble surrounding exile, while he was still a child, I'm guessing he knew what it was to be poor and in need. If you want a good example of what true giving is, then look no further than the Macedonian churches. They had almost nothing. And yet these Christians amazed Paul, not only by the level of their generosity, but also by their willingness to give. In fact, it was more than that. They begged Paul to allow him to be partners in his char charitable work, which suggests that he had told them previously not to be too bothered, as he knew their financial situation was poor. That wasn't what they wanted to hear. There was a need. They could help. They gave of themselves first in service to God, and then in service to those in need. Sacrificial giving includes a part of the giver. It's the gift to a loved one that asks for nothing in return, but within it expresses the love and concern of the giver. It's the gift that is given because the heart sees a need and says, give and do not count the cost. That's the gift that is blessed by God. Organisations like Christian Aid and Tear Fund have been at the forefront of campaigning for quality. And it's not just about equality, sorry. And it's not just about handing out food parcels. More importantly, it's about empowering people in the developing or third world to start their own business, learn how to employ ag agricultural techniques that will sustain them for the future, or simply to educate the generation who are growing up and who will be the future of those countries. It can also mean standing up for the downtrodden and campaigning for justice. It's the giving of money, yes, but it's also the giving of knowledge and skills, of accepting that all are equal in God's eyes and that we have a responsibility to all of God's children. Compassion for the poor and needy is at the heart of the Christian gospel. There is no get out clause. We are called, like the Macedonian churches, to become partners in Christ's compassion to the poor and the needy majority in the world. <coughs> Excuse me. The month of May always reminds me of Christian needs. And I, along with Nancy Bullock for almost six years represented the South, and we used to arrange collections in the district. And this is a memory which I used to share with some people in the church. I'll always remember an unforgettable situation I encountered. On approaching a door in one of my streets, I heard a lot of shouting and arguing, interrupted with a few explicit words. I thought I might be best to walk away, but I hesitated. And I thought that if I didn't knock, then the arguing might stop. So against my better judgment, I did knock. And voices, did. but I then heard footsteps walking up the hallway. The door opened and said, what is it? I just smiled and expressed, and that I was collecting for I was inwardly very nervous. They said, I'm sorry, Mrs. I don't have any money. To which I replied, that's okay. I'll maybe get you the next time, thanks. So he closed the door and I, with great, quickly made an exit. Continued along the street and suddenly heard the voice shout, Mrs. Oh, Mrs. Fearfully looking back, I saw the young man running towards me with his hand, his face scarlet with the effort of running. Here, missus, this is all I've got, but you can have it. It was a bag full of coppers that he had, but he gave it for Christian aid. I couldn't thank him enough. I felt as though he had given me a million dollars. I continued along my way, feeling as though I was walking on air because of his gift. I felt annoyed at myself because when I first heard him, I was afraid he might be angry with me. Later, I realised that I was judging him. God showed me in that young man's action just exactly I was in being fearful. He is the judge 
and I am his servant. I will always remember that young man's face and his extreme generosity. And I hope that we as Christians remember we are called, like the Macedonian churches, to become partners in Christ's compassion to the poor and needy majority in this world, to help others less fortunate than ourselves, show the world we care about them. Your gift is important, no matter how big or how small. Many of you will know that Joanne is doing 300,000 steps for Christian Aid, and if you would like to sponsor her, please phone her. Do take care whilst out and about. Stay safe, and may the Lord bless you. Amen. Loving Heavenly Father, who knows all our needs before we bring them to you, we humbly now bring our prayers for for others and ourselves. We firstly think of all those throughout the world bereaved and still suffering due to the COVID pandemic, particularly thinking of those in India and Brazil. Thank you Lord for the vaccine programme being rolled out in this and other countries and we bring before you all those countries where this has not been able to take place and pray for an equitable rollout throughout the world. God of compassion, hear our prayer. We also bring before you all of our brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the world, particularly thinking of those who face persecution or worse. With grateful hearts, we thank you for all the work that has been done throughout the world in your name that is allowing others to access the good news, come to a deeper relationship with you, and making a difference to so many lives in many ways. God of love, hear our prayer. Lord, we bring before you all those struggling with their physical and mental health, from the effects of violence and abuse, anxieties about the future, employment and finance, all those who have no hope. God, who alone provides peace beyond understanding, hear our prayer. We bring before you all those in positions of power and all those who were successful in the recent elections. May you inspire each of them to seek to be a voice for all those who have been marginalised in society and to work towards justice for all. God of all wisdom, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray all around the world would have equal access to food, water, health, social care, education, employment, and all life opportunities. God of justice, hear our prayer. We ask you would be with each of our newly appointed nominating committee as they seek to go forward, looking for a new minister for both congregations. Go before and guide them in all they say and do in their work. God who works for all our good, hear our prayer. Lord, forgive each of us for the times we have fallen short of being the people you call us to be. May your spirit be a guide and strength to us as we each continue on our faith journeys. God of forgiveness, hear our prayer. Lord, hear all of these prayers in the name of our precious Saviour, Christ Jesus. Amen.
let us join in saying the grace together. And if we don't hear each other, we're still aware that we have been worshipping our God together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and remain always. Amen.